Recording in progress. We are here to pick up. There has been a little, let's just say a little action on the superhero nerd Marvel front uh, since we've gotten together that's been important. <laughs> we had to wait until oh my. we both caught up. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, man, let's just say it's a whole multiverse of stuff to talk about. Yes. Gee, there's a reference. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start today. See where it takes us too, because it's a fascinating. Uh, uh, it was a fascinating project to see done the way that they chose to do it. But we're talking about Marvel's Moon Knight. I got um, turned on to Moon Knight several years ago, actually because of the the DID diagnosis or or the disassociative identity disorder. I was talking to someone who had. DID. And this was back when the movie A uh, Split came out, if yeah. people are familiar. <laughs> the the Yeah, I remember that the, one, yeah. The secret secret sequel to Unbreakable and the uh the second in the trilogy that turned into Glass, that we won't. Uh, that's a uh, people have feelings There's a whole other that, rabbit hole we can go yeah, down exactly. later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put that on the to-do list, Dwight. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but uh, when I asked the, this individual, I said, "So when you see that depicted, is that offensive?" I was just curious, right? Because because yeah. uh, you know McAvoy's performance was really good, and I was uh, at the time talking to someone uh, tangentially about it for a movie podcast that a friend of mine was doing, and and this person just said, "No," they said, "I don't personally find that offensive." Um, also, there's a spoiler for Split. It kind of turns out that the person is not mentally ill. They actually are possessed by this other, you know, whatever creature or something. So, mm-hmm. um, they actually have some, some superpowers that go along with it. And, and maybe they're not actually DID, um, is what this, you know, the person pointed out. And they said, it. but, the, and, and once again, not representative. They said it, it certainly probably is very offensive to some people. They said the thing that bugged them, though, was, you don't see m- many other characters with DID unless they're scary or murderers. And so there we go. And uh, it was around that time that, but all of a sudden, Moon Knight's right in front of me. And I start asking people like, so w- which Moon Knight should I read to get, you know? And so when this came out and they announced it, I was excited. What's kind of what's your background with the character? And this is the thing, the, the, the series that I got into was actually where it, it's the one that has to do with the West Coast Avengers and the schizophrenia diagnosis. Well, and again, and so this is this idea that it's been a place where it's been like so many other Marvel things, there's variations, right? So you've got the, just the, you know, possession by Khonshu, you've got these other things that go into mental health and, and have you question what reality is, which I also find really interesting when you're looking at anything that's done. Um, whether it's, you know, like we're mentioning with the, the Unbreakable trilogy or, again, especially something in the Marvel universe, well, what's your reality, right? Because these are constructed realities and, and anything. Else. So that's where I got into it. And so when this one came up, and it, it, interesting that you had somebody ask you that question, I was kind of like, you can read whatever you want, but also what I've come to learn, you know, through the MCU is that if they are going to draw from canon, they're not going to necessarily like you're never getting that. Here's the blah, 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 blah series. And it's, you know, it'll be, yeah, we've taken some things from this. We've done this, but then they'll also bring in new things that are still consistent, but there's new Canon. And again, which only makes sense, especially now that we finally officially have a multiverse, but in the movies, but it's literally, you know, been in, in the comics and in my mind in there forever. So for me, it was just back. I just want to sit back and enjoy the ride and see what they do and how they do it and, and what kind of position, you know, what, what perspective you're given, especially in light of how they played with perspective before. And again, I would say that one of the best examples would have been um, with WandaVision mm-hmm. and that idea, you know, of watching the, the show and, and watching it change, you know, in terms of eras and those kinds of things. And, you know, and then people coming in and out of, the, you know, changing and coming into the, out of the hex and all those kinds of things. So that for me, it was a sit back, watch the ride, see where it goes. OK, yes, they've mentioned, um, you know, disassociative identities. So let's see where they go. I think the part that I love the most was wondering what they were going to do in terms of the relationship, again, predominantly with with Mark and Stephen. And, and who is going to be, ident- you know, okay, yes, technically it's always Mark that's considered the, the primary or the original identity, but are they going to do that? And the fact that they started with Stephen was like, okay, we're, 
where are they going with this? How are they going to do it? And, and the fact that going to your thing about representation, the fact that it has been done, what I would say is very thoughtfully, empathetically, and that the humor that's there is not any kind of a demeaning humor. It's sort of the weird thing about the, oh my God, I've just woken up or what's the thing or it's saying this, like something that the, I guess you say the organic humor that comes out of that disorientation, like poor dude is like, you know, going on a date with somebody, but who, and then, then, okay, I'm ready for the date. And oh, two days ago, I guess I'm going to have to have a steak now. Cause I feel bad for the wait staff. And, <laughs> oh, you know. and I'll tell you, I mean, right in that first episode, they really captured some, some of the things that are not depicted very much with like severe mental health, especially it deals with anything with psychosis, DID, mm-hmm. and which DID obviously they're, DID, schizophrenia, not the same thing, but they're depicted very closely sometimes. Closely, they, yeah. But anything that has to do with a break from reality, they 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 love in in uh, Hollywood or whatever in in fiction. They love to depict the scarier elements, the mysterious elements. But the thing that they don't is actually the biggest risk to those who have those diagnoses is sadness, loneliness, depression. Yeah. That it's very depressing to. I mean, that and and. Oscar Isaacs does a great nonverbal. I, for some reason, as I was watching this and he would switch personalities on camera, it was like I, I felt like he was working out at a like a micro expression level almost, you know. And his yeah, when like he even orders, when you see the two of them scream side by side, and he's got two different screams and two facial expressions. Yes, <laughs> and he does that that scene you mentioned where it's like, oh, I made a date, I missed it, I don't know what day it is. I don't know what the hell's going on. And then while well, the, the waiter comes up and he does that, where, of course, and the character's a vegan, doesn't yeah. know how to order a steak, really, <laughs> but doesn't care. And, and so so there was all this this crestfallen. You just felt that for a minute where it was like, that would be so sad. Just, just the sadness, not so much even this the social awkwardness, which once again is played up in most projects, but I, they really, re- and then again, when he wakes up on the bus after having this horrific experience with Conchu. And so there's this like just sadness, fear. You get this like depressing feeling of, I don't have control of my life. Right. And that's what I loved about it. The most was you, okay. You're not necessarily seeing it through his eyes, but you are getting what I would say, you know, Steven's perspective on things. You're getting the most, what I would consider most authentic thing, because like you say, the representation always tends to be that external and scary. Look at the scary person that's behaving this way. It's erratically, it's disorienting. And it's like, no, no, no. Now you're seeing the disorientation from their perspective and you're seeing the disorientation. So, and I remember a friend who, you know, again, knows that I do the Marvel stuff and all this kind of stuff. This was not something they were familiar with. Like, yeah, they, you know, they're more familiar with again, Spider-Man and the other big names kind of thing. And, you know, wanted to watch this. And it was this, what's going on? What's going on? I have no idea. It's like, Oh, you're three episodes in and you're confused. Good. That's where you're supposed yes, to be. Yes, like yes, that's yes. That, that actually, if you think you are finishing an episode and knowing at the end, what exactly is going on, you're missing the point. Like it's right. the, if, if you're confused, good, you're supposed to be just as confused as the characters are because, and then to me, that's that, that's the authenticity of it because you're literally again from it. There is no, you know, the origin story doesn't come till the end. You're walking in midstream into this, poor bugger's life and he doesn't know what's going on he's getting again very lonely lives by himself has a horrific boss and staff you know fellow staff members that don't know his name um tries to be nice to a kid like like he's just like yeah like they embody that and you just like how could you not be anything but empathetic with Stephen grant it's interesting too because as you mentioned um and I think movies at this point, when we were growing up, there was this attitude of like, if you go to a superhero movie, you look for a retelling of a comic mm-hmm. book. Now they've actually jumped into where it's its own continuity. It's its own. It's like a run of comics that is different. Spider-Man, you know, Iron Man was his mentor in this universe, in this version, yeah. right? Where it wasn't and whatever. And so uh, one of the things that they redid is... Uh, and and I'll say, I, you know, having read some of Moon Knight before this came out, I'm not going to claim to be a heavy – anybody out there who's a Moon Knight, a really, really into Moon Knight and has a lot of info, and you feel free to correct me, you know, and reach out to whatever. But 
Um, yeah, yeah, same go, here. Like again, that's at, that's not my biggest rabbit hole in the Marvel right. universe. Yeah, if you, if <laughs> might become one. <laughs> if you're real, if you're real angry at me, just tweet at me at speak dash up. Is that what it is? I'm trying to think of how I want to send it to your Twitter to get yeah, mad okay. at me. <laughs> Anyone angry, just hit Sharon up and tell him that that guy sucks. But, yeah. <laughs> no. Anyway, though, so, but but my experience is that Stephen Grant in the comics, this is one thing they changed, where Stephen Grant was like the Bruce Wayne figure, is like this millionaire, and and he, when he is Mister Knight, as we see in the suit and everything, he's driving around in a limo doing his fighting evil version of like you know Mark being Moon Knight swinging from rooftops, right? So they have this kind of different thing. Um, where where he is like the the philanthrop philanthropic oh, yeah philanthropic like the, there we go it's easy easy for yeah. you to say not me <laughs> but, so you know he's he is that person and that's a fine character but it was interesting to see how not only does this someone that I I feel like maybe most of us can relate to a little bit better than that mysterious millionaire but also encompasses what we're talking about which is the risk of I'm just over here in my own little corner and I can't really invite anyone else in, right? I can't really feel safe inviting anyone else in. I've got myself chained to a bedpost to make sure. I've got a sand trap to make sure I don't leave, you know. Yeah, I tape up my door to make sure that, yeah, all these things. Well, and I think that's the other thing is, is, is this is the other part of it is that you've had those different variations, again, with the, again, the different um, I mean, or even originally, uh, if I'm trying to remember which version it was, I think it might've been the first one where it was the idea that these are actually alter egos, like alter, like secret identities yeah. that he used to facilitate different things. So it's, I'm the same guy, but I go under this name to do this and it allowed him access to different worlds. So, I mean, they've already played with this a little bit and I love the way they're playing with this now. Yeah. And, and the fact that, um, like I said, to me, it was the, the walking in in this way that it was again very empathetic and that again like you say very sad because he has these experiences and then they, they view the videotape of what happens in the museum and he's like oh, wait for the and you're like okay no dude's all by himself there's none of this stuff and it's the oh gosh okay this is a me thing and and so this idea though of like again what the reality was what these different characters represent i also found it interesting too that as you go further along in the story as to who, you know, the who's protecting who, because I think the other part that a lot of people forget is what, like where disassociation fits in and, and how, and what, so, I mean, all of us disassociate in some way, shape or form. At some point we've all done the car, you know, the driving to the work or driving to the mall or whatever, and you get caught in your own thoughts. And then it's, you're pulling into the parking lot going, how did I get here? And I'm assuming that if any accidents might have happened along the way, the sounds out there, or you know that I may have caused, like there were the sounds of brakes or screeching or honking or something that got me out of it. Yeah. Oh, so right. Yeah. So we've all had that. So I think that's even where that similarity to the bus was. Like you know that's right up there with the nodding off on the bus or the subway. And you do the thing, and oh god, because <laughs> you've fallen asleep weird dream. So it was it, that idea that um, you know. They gave you kind of those little tastes of it, but then on that larger scale of, okay, well, well, why? Like it doesn't, you know, okay, not, you know, those kinds of things that happen in daily life. Well, it happened for a reason. You got caught up in your own head. Some part of your brain, you know, has driven this route 15 times, you know, every week. So therefore you're on autopilot and it keeps you safe, hopefully. Um, but it's still that, oh my God, I was operating a one ton vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, or an autopilot, ice, pilot, not cool. Even an ice, uh, even a, a cupcake truck, you know. It yeah, could be. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> the fact that he was doing these things, and well, and that was the other part too. The, when you see him moving between these different places, and then you're realizing like he's losing days. This is not just the, and that you're losing track of the reality and especially too. And I think this is where I like about how they did it. And again, you find this out, like not in a linear way, but that whole thing that we are dropped into the middle of his life. We are then dropped into him, you know, suddenly being in different places. And again, this suddenly he's got this voice in his head. And then you realize later on, as Mark tells him, well, it all had to do with, you know, it all started around the time of mom's death. That's when the walls between us started to break down. So you realize it's about these two people that have been ha inhabiting the same body, the same brain, but they literally haven't got to know each other or become really aware, or at least one less aware of the, you know, the walls are finally coming down. So you're a part of that 
integrate that relationship, eventual integration and those things. And I think that was, again, something, yes, it's done in a certain kind of, you know, within this narrative arc. But again, thinking about the stuff that you and I would have been watching related to this, I mean, we're of the era where, you know, um, first of all, we grew up with it, you know, being called multiple personality disorder. And it was the time of like Sybil and, you know, Sally Fields. And, and like you say, all the scary representations or the and the one that always got me was the um, in soap operas. And, 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 you know, and it was, I always, you know, whenever that, that would come up for some character, you're like, my, my thought was always, okay, so somebody's getting upset that they didn't get the Emmy nod that they wanted. They don't feel like they're being pushed enough. They havenven't had anything exciting happen with their character, yada, yada, yada. Oh, so now suddenly they're going to have some sort of disassociative identity again, which would have been called something else then. But, yeah. and, and that even though they might have a little tag about it later on in terms of being like a positive mental health message, you're like, Oh my God, this was so much more uh, about them and the over the top drama and the movie of the week vibe, all like all that garbage. And then it's like, Oh, we can, you know, throw in a mental health thing and look progressive. Yes. <laughs> yes well, exactly. And, and trying to, when it's actually the opposite, the opposite of progressive mm. where it's like, Oh yeah, but one of them's in the evil personality. Yeah. Of course. Oh so God. That's yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and not that they're necessarily, I mean, cause storytelling is always fascinating with that kind of thing. And I guess, you know, not, not to say that depictions are completely innocent of that, but there's a couple of things, some we've already touched on, that actually uh, amplify this in a more healthy way, right? Hmm. Um, and, and for example, the functionality, and that's the piece mm -hmm. that people forget. And yes. and when you go back to when there was this kind of splinter uh, off and Steven started to come into existence, he was there to protect Mark. And we think mm -hmm. of uh, Mark's the soldier, he's the superhero fighter man, he's the whatever. And it's like, no, no, this happened, and typically this is where I, I heard this from a psychiatrist long ago, and I'm always interested in people's experiences who've actually been there. So anybody, once again, hit me up. Uh, but, uh, but it seems to match most of the people I've met with DID that uh, you move from a, a, a place where you are vulnerable and weak to a place where you are stronger. Now, but stronger can be interpreted different ways, obviously. It's not like, oh, I move yeah. into a personality who can murder everyone, which is like what the old school, like, oh, the the yeah. bad guy, whatever. It's like, in this case, it was, no, I'm going to move into uh, a personality, a life that has a happy home life. That, um, yeah. that is this kind of, and when you look at it, you know, one of the things about Steven is he's a, you know, he seems a little bit like uh, bullied and, you know, uh, kowtowed or whatever uh, to, to people who are pushing him around. But he's essentially a nice guy who yeah. loves his mom, who's interested in, you know, in, in, interested in antiquity and studies and self-improvement and all of those I, things. I wouldn't, wouldn't hurt a fly, always trying to be helpful as opposed to when, again, when you think about all the guilt that... Mark carries. So it's that, that idea of, you know, from the, I consider myself a murderer, even mm -hmm. both things that, you know, because of things I've been blamed with right back to a phase where it's like, okay, you were a child and this was an accident, but you're being held accountable for this to all the other things where, again, you weren't necessarily the lead on this, but, or you were told, you know, so it's, 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 it's all of this guilt and this negative perception of himself as this violent murderous person. So what is the, the altar that he creates this proverbial wouldn't hurt a fly guy that has the, the single finned goldfish, yes. you know, got to get a, <laughs> You know, that would have been the, oh my God, here's this poor fish and probably nobody else is going to take him. So I'm going to bring him home and I'm going to call him Gus and this and that, whatever. Yeah. Like it was just that, you know, <laughs> even, even the little girl, when she's sticking garbage in there, he doesn't like call her out. It's the, oh, it looks like somebody's, you know, yeah. mistaken this for a garbage dump and just, you know, da, 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 and whatever. And, you know, and then, and then, you know, takes her over to the thing. And, oh, this is where they're going to stick the hook in and drag all your innards out. Uh, <laughs> You know, again, don't get me wrong, a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of a dark thing there, but he was just trying to be Mr., yet, you know, and yet polite. Not, and that one of the things that I also really appreciated it about it was that he was not a weak character. He wasn't, I, I didn't feel like he was portrayed as a weakling. He was just, in the beginning, first episode, I thought, you know, he's not a weakling. He is someone who isn't comfortable in a fight with six mercenaries at once. But that's in that way very much like most of us. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people have this kind of like, oh, this low-key low, low key action hero vibe in their own mind of like, here's, 
you know, oh, come on, just grab the gun. And it's like, no, most of us would be the person who throws the gun at someone and is like, oh, wait, that was a gun. I, 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 probably shouldn't have thrown that. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And he literally says, I don't know what I'm doing. And he's the reasonable one when Conchie's like, hey, do something. And he's like, I don't know what to do. I'm a normal person. Yeah. I've just woken up in a foreign country. People are doing some weird stuff. And now I'm having to run away again. And, and that was even, I think, the thing, too, with the what's his escape vehicle? I mean, it's the cupcake the cupcake van. truck, right, right? You know, cupcake right. truck, and it's just—it's like it's—it's it's all of these things that I think were the really again these really interesting nods, and that like I said, you saw it in a sense from his perspective because it's the oh, and then something happens, and now I'm all bloody, and what the heck? Okay, and people are you know well, even the fact too that when he he came to on that at hill and he sort of pulls himself together and he sees those guys from the window and he like waves and he has no he's idea saying, that these hey. are the people that have been shooting at him and he's just like oh hi people in the window. <laughs> now there's a speaking of a little Easter egg potential. Did you? I don't know if you saw this, but somebody online this has oh. nothing nothing to do with any clinical, but uh, that castle. They never explain whose castle that is, really. I don't know that Harrow has no. a castle. He doesn't seem like a castle type of guy. Um, however, it does seem to match. It's, a, it's some kind of vaguely Eastern European country, potentially. And uh, it does seem to look a lot like the castle of a certain Victor Von Doom, uh, according to people, you know, some comic panels that I've seen posted on Twitter. So there you go. Could it have been maybe he was stealing that from Dr. Doom's personal library who knows yeah. yeah yeah well and i think that's the other part too is now how they're doing all these things where you can have interconnections and have these things and and a thing that might be a random detail over here turns out to be an easter egg for something else right. but you didn't know it was an easter egg yet so or, and, okay and well, I'll keep... they can just have it as its own little thing or they can bring it back in later if people loved it too you know you yeah, never know yeah. what they're up to but yeah uh, we'll... no one of the thoughts uh, that i also have uh, along with the functionality piece is they they depict how um, uh, the two, not the third as much. We'll maybe we'll mention him in a little bit, but yeah. the two uh, that Mark and Stephen. There is also this friendship when when they are thrown into the existential sort of like after death, after life, whatever with the the wonderful <laughs> hippo goddess. Yeah, um, yeah. That is, they have this this meeting this great meeting that I think I saw online. Everybody I saw comments on it loved this scene where. Mark finds Stephen embodied. They're embodied separately, and the first thing they do is embrace that they are in this together. That they can relate to each other in a way that no one else can. Right? Um, whether they're angry with each other or whether they're hugging each other, that there there's this real brotherhood kind of thing. Mm. Right? Whereas everything before, and again, especially considering you're seeing it predominantly from um, Stephen's side initially, it was you started like it was the reflection thing, which again I also thought was a really interesting vehicle for how they would communicate or how you would you would see it was it and and so yes it was always that and there was always things again usually mark telling you know mark telling Stephen, no 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 give me the body and that's the other part too is you know so he comes to and it's like give him the body and give me the what (laughs) and and so that idea that there was always this conflict and and mark not wanting to tell him necessarily why it's just like no 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 this is the thing and i need to do it and you can't handle this and, and where he made that one comment about the, well, no, actually, I have been through this before, you know, same body, right? So hopefully some muscle memory. And you're like, well, okay, I'm not quite sure how that really translates the way you think it does. But, you know, not on, on one level, not a wrong assumption for him to be making as he's trying to sort this all out and wanting to be, and especially when you think about the fact that, again, at, at that place where they're walking in, and I think this goes to that whole how this stuff unfolds, is the fact that it's the, I clearly know something's up. I don't know what it is. I keep either, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly like blacking out, losing time, ending up in weird places. So I've got all of these things in place, but I don't know exactly what it is. And, and so I'm trying to stay up all night and I'm trying to do all of like all of these weird management things. And then again, they have the functionality of, okay, well, here's all the Egyptian stuff that I'm going to study. And here's all these, you know, these things. And, you know, you stop and think about it. Like that see that, that is a much more, I guess you say organic and natural process that on some level, yes, this has happened. And there's been this creation of an altar, but it's 
done generally, you know, in such a seamless way, you know, nobody sits down on a Tuesday afternoon and says, oh, I need to cope with this. And so therefore I'm going to manufacture this alternate identity and reality into da, 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 and compart. I mean, we all compartmentalize in certain ways, but, and, and consciously that's, you know, <laughs> That's not what this is. And so when it, it's when other things come up that you realize something. And so it's this weird thing. Well, on one level, your brain has created it. You actually tend to go a very long time before you realize that and you realize. And, and so it was that to me, it was, again, that very natural thing where it's like something's up. Yeah. I don't know what it is. And it's it's very much like how people talk about this uh, concept of hearing voices. And when we say mm-hmm. that, it's like hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Our, all of our brains have this capacity to yeah. hear things and say things. It's just it, it depends on if the intensity, the frequency, and whether or not we are consciously having control of it. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we're all talking to ourselves in our heads all the time, right? Just like we disassociate and we compartmentalize and we segment – Sometimes on purpose and sometimes organically, but we become it, it becomes something that all of a sudden we look at as this crazy, weird, supernatural, creepy. But it's like no, it's actually an extension of natural coping skills. It's just an inflated or or I should say inflamed. Perhaps it was one yeah, yeah. way to put it. Um, but one of, one of the things that I, I thought was very powerful was the moment where uh, uh, Harrow, the the bad guy, uh, yeah. the Ethan Hawke bad guy who uh, turns to, you know, he's talking to Steven and he says, do you think Khonshu selected you because you were broken or did he break you essentially? And I love yeah. that one part of Steven's reply in that was I'm not broken. That's, right? Oh and yeah. So here's someone who, right. Is mentally vulnerable, who obviously has, you know, disassociative identity disorder as we would label it now, but he's saying, I'm not broken. And that I thought was a very powerful message to slip in there, which and and people I've known over the years who have come to accommodate their alternates, you know, and to integrate into where there is that shared awareness. It, yeah. Once again, this is, you know, Hollywoodified or whatever, but to say that there is actually strengths in each alternate and each alter that that do oh. take turns and that handing the driver's seat over to someone consciously often not consciously but to sort of there there is a trust in the greater intention to protect and be good for myself that that people uh, tend to develop over time as they get more healthy it, and i think people usually would think well healthy healthy means the the alters go away right but that's not always the case no, no. It, yeah. it, it, again, it's, it's about the integration and the management. And that was the thing, too, is watching Harrow and trying to figure out who Harrow represented. And especially when you see Harrow then as Dr. Harrow and, and, and the idea that, you know what, he's saying the same thing in both places. Um, and, and, and again, going to this idea, and maybe this is a little meta, um, you know, he even made a comment at one point, again, about this idea of um, organizing you know, methods, organizing systems, and that these are just frameworks. And then, uh, and, and then that conversation goes a particular way, like, you know, these are just organizing things and da, 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 and we just, and you're like, oh, wait a second, you've naturally led to a place where it's like, hmm, what, again, what is reality? Because I think for most folks, and again, what, what you expect is the, oh, and he comes to, and he's in a psych ward. So therefore that must be reality and all of this is whatever. And you're like, well, wait a second. There is nothing to say that the psych ward actually isn't in fact just a construct and maybe is a way of viewing all of these other things. So it's not about he sees these things in Harrow's office and then based on whatever it is, he's now created these other identities <laughs> and these other things influenced by these or influenced by this childhood movie. It's not a mental this health could, version. This could of, actually uh, be, this could actually be the yeah. organizing construct that allows him to sort some of this out in a different way. So there's nothing saying that that's the reality. And, and, or, and, and especially too, when that stuff happens again, after he's been shot and it's the, okay, well, again, if he's just been shot, he's probably unconscious or in some other kind of a mental state. So again, is this really reality or is it just, again, one of these things? And I think that's the part that I love about this is that in my mind, I still don't know what reality is. And that as much as I know that there are 
um, you know, a, a variety of alters and that, and, and I, going back and rewatching, we were actually introduced to Jake in the first episode. Yes. We just didn't know it. And that you have these different things and, and especially, and you realize afterwards when there's these different things where it's like, you know, wait a second, that's, that's even bloodier than, Oh, wait a second. Oh, that's a Jake moment. Like my guess is that that stuff that happened with Harrow in that first, that's a Jake thing. Yeah. That was, that was, but we just didn't know it was Jake because, you know, again, like Steven, we're just flipped out about the, what the heck castle guy hey, with the, hmm, you well, know, and even, <laughs> blood, even, more, like, yeah. even in a more subtle way. Uh, so it wasn't until I'd seen the second or third episode that someone else said, when it was a uh, something online where those of us who knew that there's a Jake Lockley in there, that there's a third more violent personality, or or at least more street scrapper kind of personality yeah. that has less or less rules, let's say, still a, a good guy, uh, anti-hero kind of approach. So yeah. we're kind of like, are they going to bring him in? Are they not? They changed Stephen. What are they going to do? Uh, somebody else brought this up to me, and I hadn't thought of it. Who asked the girl out? I mean, who asked that woman out? That's that wasn't Mark. Mark's not going to ask her out. He's, you know, I mean, and so I was like, oh, no, no that's right. Yeah. So that's, even I, I, That didn't <laughs> dawn on me until later, because at first you're figuring again, you know, OK, they're going to play Mark and 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 Stephen first and and whatever. So you fear Mark and you're like, oh, yeah, but there's the accent thing. And that's like, oh, no, no, no. They've got his wife involved. So why would he? And then you're like, oh, wait a second. Exactly. There's, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's somebody else here. <laughs> yeah, right away. And they, they dropped point, it yeah. in the first one, but wasn't named. And at this point, again, like Stephen, you don't know what's going on. And well, and even that realization, and again, Mark later on, with the not wanting to take him into certain places in certain rooms and that whole reality of, oh, wait a second, I'm not the primary identity. Right. And and that, re, you know, and so he had his, you know, so they had that little existential crisis moment of the, you know, who came first kind of thing. And, oh, wait a second, it wasn't me. And where and, is, right. Where does this guy fit in? It's an interesting thing because uh, is, you know, is that leaning into, and I guess we'll have to see if and when they go on and we see more development with this character, this third, yeah. the third personality, the third alter or second alter, if you, I don't know how we're counting them. Anyway, the third personality yeah. that lives within, uh, within Moon Knight. So do, are they leaning into the trope of here's a violent one, at least, well, okay, here's the evil violent personality. Um, I think I think at this point, it to me, if I'm being, and I tend to be generous being a Marvel stan, right? So I look at that and say, maybe. It's like, there's a risk there, right? I mean, they're, they're yeah. risking stepping right into that and they avoided it so elegantly with the other two. I guess you'll have to wait and see. I know based off the source material, uh, uh, Jake Lockley's like this sort of like street smart, like cabbie yeah. who is a, like a criminal, criminally involved, who's not afraid yeah. to get his hands dirty in certain ways and uh, takes care of some of the nastier things like Unconchu is like, kill this guy. It's like Mark would be like, I'm not going to just kill a guy. And Steven would absolutely not want to just kill a guy. <laughs> Jake would be like, is he a bad guy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's yeah. a bad guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, and and I think that's the other part too, though. That even if you go into that, where yes, he's technically more violent. This this is what goes back to the idea, and again, right from the very beginning of the whole stuff with Conchu and the justice idea. So, in other words, if he thinks he's doing it for a good cause, you know, un, unlike. Mark somewhat and, and, and Steven for sure. And I would say even the whole, like the, the Batman code of conduct, right. He doesn't, Jake does not have the Batman code of conduct. <laughs> and so it's the, whatever needs to be done, it's for the greater good. Um, and so I think that's even, I think that's even why he's only kind of dripped in there in those little hidden, again, kind of Easter egg ways that, um, because there's something else that he leans towards and that that's probably going to go more into the dynamic with Conchu as well. And I, and again, I would still see it as being less of the scary representation, stereotypical representation that we've seen of, of, uh, DI and of schizophrenia than where does this alter function and how and why? And so Stephen is, you know, Mark has got this lousy batch of stuff and, and just tons of guilt. So here's, here's Stephen that gets to have the, the nice, very, you know, I mean, it, it, 
I would say proper life in the sense that it's even like he's a proper English, you know, guy that works at a at a museum and does all this, you know, stuff. And he's just so kind and, and whatever. He's Is he quirky? Absolutely. But again, still very well intentioned and polite. So I think that's the other part that I like about this whole, again, the... Yeah, that, that portrayal there of, of Stephen, I think, is really wonderful. And I think what's interesting, too, is when you go into the Harrow stuff, Harrow's saying the same thing on both sides. And it and it goes back to that language that you mentioned about broken. In bro- both cases, it's about brokenness. And what I came to realize is that in, in some respects, what he represented to me, I mean, yes, obviously, there's the characters and, the, you know, again, what we're doing in terms of the narrative and the, the associations and different things he kind of represents the broader society stereotype. So in other words, and and, and knowing what's right, because that's the other thing, in both cases, he taps into some, I know better than you. Like I've already dealt with Khonshu. I know all about this. And this is why da, 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 da. And this is why you need to do this and stop being used by him. But you got to come over to Amit now. Or it's the, you know, his little sense nonsense pendulum. And I'm like, okay, I get where you think that works. But, that, you know, it, it's also the, yeah, you know, oh, but why are you bleeding? And I, and I still love the line where I, I don't think you know as much about this as you think you do from. No. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, yes, the, here's the line. The so fact I, that it, yeah, the fact that it comes from, well, first of all, I mean, that's another Jake moment when he stands up and yeah. he's like, you know, you must get pretty good. Yeah, you're pretty good at this. Yeah, doc, yeah, I can, and then it, but I love that it went to Steven. And this is another ep- episode, uh, episode example of Stephen being a personality of strength, right? Of strength in his positions, because he's the one who's like, look, do I think this is real where I'm going to be in this hospital and you're, look at your foot bleeding. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go back to where I'm saving the world and be that character. Um, And like a choice, like I'm making a choice to invest in the belief and the faith that this is my real life. Um, And which also, you know, which, when he first has a conversation with Harrow as well, he actually, and they, they, they write it so that it's, you know, it's a chuckle as well. It's a comedic ish, but when he says, so you're going to take out people who are going to do something bad. So children. (laughs) And he's like, is everybody here? Okay with that. And like almost incredulous, which once again, he is not a warrior. He's not a soldier. He's sitting surrounded by those bad people. He could easily go, yeah, yeah, whatever you say, sure, sure. I'm that weakling. I'm that weakling. But instead, yeah. he's principled and says, "I'm not going to. I'm not even going to yeah. pretend really, to agree you with you." Really, you can up with killing babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even going to pretend to agree with you because he's morally strong, mm-hmm. right? Well, and even when he comes back, you know, uh, again after they decide they're both going to do this together, and it's the whole renegotiating with Conchu, and you know, he comes up as Mr. Moon, and and then gets into this, and like, oh my god, he sent the Indians. Like, well, what are we going to do? And da 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 da. It's like really at a time like this with so much at stake, you're going to negotiate. And it's like. Learned from the best bird brain, you know, <laughs> like, you, you taught me this, right. like if there's anybody that, and, and, and so, yeah, so he is a protector and, and that you get those different lines too, especially again, I think about in Dua, and again, one of those times where, again, where there's the big hug and the whatever, it's like the no, 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 like you are actually, he, nothing to apologize for, you've done all of these things, like he acknowledges what's happened to Mark and the role that they've played and all these different kinds of things. And I think that's the other part that I really enjoy about this is that it's about this growing relationship between the two of them, which again, Bernie said, this doesn't exactly parallel, you know, uh, the, you know, the uh, integration process that most would go through, but it does, I would say, reflect the the energy and the authenticity of it in a cinematic way and that we haven't seen done well otherwise. So yes, it's right. not clinical, clinically accurate, but I think it actually captures the authenticity of it, which I find really interesting I, when you consider, you know, what kind of a fantastical world this is, they're actually able to capture the spirit, the energy and the outcome in ways that's more authentic than the again the movie of the week supposedly all pro mental well, health fuzzy and movies. if we can you know and it's one of those things where if we can have a training montage where rocky trains in a week to be an expert boxer and we we wink and nod at that and we say yeah yeah i know that it would take longer and let's just assume that the music this one mm-hmm. song you know is is encompassing we can certainly see someone accommodate their altars right in this way and and i feel like one of the great things and 
you know, I, I sometimes extend this farther than some people do, but I think you're cool. I'll, I'll see how cool you yeah. are with it. Um, as far as strengths based, I know you and I are both radically strengths based is what I would call it. Right. Yeah. We talk about <laughs> the superpowers and, and everything that are inherent to our personality characteristics, even those that are defined as symptoms. I kind of wonder um, at what point do we stop labeling everything with the the D at the end, the disorder part? Oh, well, and that's yeah. why I don't actually call it DID. I call it dissociative yeah, so that's identity. Good. That's I, great. Any, any place I can drop the, the disorder part, I do. <laughs> that at a certain level, you know, you have to look at it and say someone's brain, not everyone's brain is capable of, of forming alters and disassociating to the point where they uh, have that big of a protector. As we said, we all do it. And especially if you work within a framework of uh, internal family systems or EMDR sometimes touches on this too a little bit, mm-hmm. which is we all have these different emotional parts of ourselves. But to actually have one that is segmented off even to the point where we might not uh, for a time in our life even be aware it exists, there's certainly – weaknesses, if we want to go superpower weakness, there's certainly risks associated with being that way. However, what is that if not, I mean, that's a superpower to have, to have a mind that can disassociate at that level. I, I, I really believe that not everyone has the capability of doing it and who knows how many people, because this is usually Almost always trauma, extreme neglect, abuse is what the the, the is genesis exactly what of you see Mark right? has gone through. Yep. And so, how many people out there have disassociative identity and are alive today because they have it? That they would have not made it, in other words, one way or another. However, you interpret that, right? Suicide, exactly. or abuse, or addiction. Yeah. Um, if they would have it's, it's, been, constantly it's the brain alive. trying to keep the brain and the body alive by whatever means necessary. Yeah. And so it's a trauma response. And yeah, when you think about the story that's there, so yeah, would Mark be alive if, if he didn't have this, you know, much more positive, joyful person that gets to have a relationship with his mom and think everything is okay and, and live, you know, a, a, frankly, a kind of middling, uh, nondescript life uh, as, as, a, as a polite, if albeit a little bit sort of milk toast British, you know, gentleman, like it's just that it's, it's like, it's all the safe, warm and fuzzy, even to the point that, yeah, he's a little bit of a doormat, but then that's because he's so, like so avoidant of confrontation because Mark's life has been filled with so much. And when you think about, again, the, what he went through and, and they have tweaked it from one of the other versions, like this is more about the family as opposed to some other stuff that had to do with the father as a rabbi. And again, so whatever, yeah. like to me, that's one of the, that's like, um, uh, you know, you're fiddling with which kind of icing is on the cake when it's really about what flavor is the cake. Um, <laughs> and so it's the, Oh, Oh, you put sprinkles on this time instead of, you know, buttercream, whatever. Um, and so it's that kind of a thing where I think, yeah, like it, to me, it makes perfect sense. It would be the, the, uh, uh, you know, as far as a coping mechanism. And I think it gets reflected first of all. And like you say, those, I'm not broken comments coupled with, um, again, in, in, in the duot where he basically in talking to, uh, Stephen Mark says, you know, you were my only superpower. Where am I? Yeah, you know, it's it's not about this this these things that Conchu gives me that makes me Moon Knight. It's the fact that you've actually protected me. Conchu's made me do some stuff that again I thought and I became indebted to him and whatever else. And and this also makes me wonder too about the relationship with Conchu. I kind of get the impression that and again being a god, you know, it's kind of playing into this. But he's the omniscient one that's aware of all the personalities. And yes. identities, and that he's made arrangements with all the ones that he wants to work with, and then oh, and then there's oh, geez, the idiot's like, got oh, the body boy. because and, he knows he knows that Stephen won't go with this, well, and, and when just, he has to do with it, yeah, then he has to do like with it. A, like a manipulator or a bully, if we want to say, and Kanchu, even in the comics, is you know famously. If you're, you know, into it a while, Conchu isn't an asshole. He is a controlling narcissistic. <laughs> and it is one of those that is kind of the, you could say the Nick Fury of this situation, but you could go a little further and say the, uh, oh my gosh, now I'm going to forget. Who's Viola Davis's character that she plays in DC 
the the evil or Nick Fury character from the DC world. You know what I'm talking about? Suicide yeah, I know, Squad. and I'm drawing a blank too. And yeah, now you yeah. say it, the deeper it goes back into my brain. Yes, the, and you know, the, I'll either blurt it out in five minutes or at three a.m. <laughs> yes, yes, and again, yes, feel yes. free to you know hit us up on social media to to fill in what's currently fallen out of our brains. We if won't I take can, a break. Yeah, if I can vamp just long enough to say Amanda Amanda Waller. There we go. Yes, I was just I had to IMDb search the Suicide Squad. Yeah. But, you know, somebody who is the, yes, greater good, although in DC, the CDC cinematic universe, she's straight up kind of a villain. But um, mm-hmm. you know, someone who's like, yeah, if I have to blow up this village in order to to kill that one person who, you know, is like, now, I don't know if Conchu, whatever. I don't want to say that. Somewhere in between. Let's put him in between Nick Fury and Amanda Waller. That's where we're going to put Conchu on yeah, the yeah. scale of well, manipulating controllers. But it is important that for Conchu to put Steven down and who knows if we want to read a little, maybe a little deeper into this than maybe I need to, but you know, it's important to, if you're going to bully someone, they need to feel less than, and everybody else is like, yeah, don't listen to him. He sucks. And then as soon as, as you put it, I hadn't thought of this till you said it. As as soon as Steven is involved, it's like, we're renegotiating. And it's like, (laughs) uh, all of a sudden, can't you Mark didn't pull this off in all the years they've worked together. Uh, uh, the other, you know, uh, uh, the other yeah. maybe didn't want to, but it's like Stephen, Mister, once again, Mister Strength Protector, moral, most moral of the three, probably most moral guidelines to say, uh, most moral strength to say, we're renegotiating, buddy. This is not cool. What you've been doing to us. Well, and I think that also plays with the idea of, again, when we think of the stereotypical descriptions of alters and what roles they play, it's the, you know, there's always the, and again, good Lord, like again, pick a soap opera, pick a whatever. It's these, the so-called protective alter is always like, again, the big tough guy, the big, what, you know, that kind of thing. And you're like, well, no, 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 actually the protector here is the soft guy. And it's because he's the morally strong you know, per the character, he's the morally strong aspect of it. And so the rest of them might, while they might have the physical strength and they might be doing certain aggressive acts are not actually as morally strong as Steven is. And, and, and I thought that was really interesting too. And even how they, first of all, introduced Konshu. And again, it's about this idea of justice and protect, you know, and, and, and meeting out justice, you know, to those who have done harm and then to watch um, Harrow's character, who, again, it's the, Oh, I used to be the, the avatar before. And this is the problem because now I, I go around with scales of justice and, you know, and I, I work on behalf of Amit and it's the idea of, you know, getting rid of people before they, they, they do the thing. And like you say, the baby comment, but what was really interesting is as you watch this, it's like, yeah, wait a second. Again, and like when you think of again, what's what's the reality and what's the hallucination part of it? You think about those scales on the arm and the fact that everywhere Stephen seems to go, it's like, oh my God, there's more people with scales on their arm. Oh, the, and again, this idea of the representation of the broader society where you're being judged, and everywhere you go, there's somebody with scales wow. and pass or fail, pass or fail. And that so that to me, in both of those realities, that's what Harrow represents is the the again. He's personified here, but the larger shoulda. This is somebody that's perpetually shooting on you, telling you <laughs> what you got wrong. And that, yes, conchu has got his own bullying narcissism thing going on. But when you bring in Amit and who Amit is, you're like, okay, well, wait a second. Suddenly Conchu's starting to look a little bit more reasonable. <laughs> Right. Because we got Mr. Like, you know, we got this crocodile purge thing going on where, yeah, apparently <laughs> offing babies is OK, because in 32 years they might do a crappy thing. And just the whole like, you know, notion of free will. And and suddenly you're like, OK, God, is a jerk. But you know what? He is not the crown prince here right now. Like there are some people beating him at his own game. And that was the other part that I, I thought, because that's that one thing where you got. OK, so you've got the the narcissist and that kind of shooting that you're getting from both Conchu in terms of his own agenda, Harrow, again, in terms of what he represents. But then you've got this other thing where, again, and it goes to that language of broken, where Amit and, and Harrow are like the, again, talk about your judgment and, and the broken notion. Talk about the, oh, you to me, that's that's right up there with when folks used to say that those of us with diagnoses, um, you know, should be sterilized. 
And, 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 and that like, it, it's like, um, it's going down the eugenics path. I don't care what, I don't care what yeah. warm fuzzy place you, you, you start off rationalizing that and thinking you're doing it like the, the slippery slope starts about two seconds after you open your mouth on that. And, and then you're one, right down into this hell. <laughs> because there has to be, yeah, there has to be an arbiter of what is and isn't broken and what is and isn't good or bad and then of course immediately there's the hypocrisy there too where harrow is like all right you're back now i assume i'm dead now right because i i suck and i'm this fanatic who i'm I'm bringing to pass this brave new world that i don't deserve to be part of and uh amit's like nah screw it and it's like even even harrow's like oh okay it's kind of weird but you know it's like (laughs) even takes your most fanatical follower aback to say no no no, i like you and um you know by the way you know the the message of course being that now you're doing the same thing i'm doing which is we're we're bad guys you know and so we're not i just want to be want to control right is kind of a thing um and it is interesting how it goes back to in a way you know here in a way you know moon knight's championing those that are innocent, but also those that are guilty that are going to be proactively pruned because what, what we're going back to this, who decides, right? Who decides if yeah. a person does bad things, you can prevent the bad things. What if they reform later? That doesn't mean that they didn't do the bad thing. If you're going on a strict scales, right? Oh, yeah. Redemption so, arts. You're totally eliminating yeah, the potential no for redemption. redemption arts. Yeah. And so, yeah, we wouldn't have Loki the show. Anyway, um, <laughs> That's what some people get a little salty about, even the level of redemption that's possible. In uh, yeah. that's why I hold out hope for for. Uh, well, we'll get into that in our next discussion yeah. about multiverse of madness. There's someone I hold out hope for there, um, oh. and which we'll get to here in a minute for today's recording. But anyway, uh, it, you get back to a theme that I think is I I, I would hope that we're going to see it throughout this phase. But I think in Shang Chi, you saw the desire to redeem dad in yeah. spider-man no way home that whole thing is about going out of my way to redeem or save people who aren't even trying to be saved right yeah <laughs> and so who knows you know what we're going to see uh, uh moving forward with some of these but there is a theme developing that actually would make a half decent or maybe decent episode as well we should think about that the saving versus the punishing <laughs> Punish, yeah oh absolutely well and it's interesting too you mentioned the again in terms of the comparison to um Spider-Man, because yeah, again, they're they're trying to see if they can redeem folks that again, in some cases really don't want redemption. But one of the lines that Harrow uses again in both realities is, you know, is the I can't help you if you don't want to help yourself. And it's like, well, wait a second, that sounds more like again, it's a well-meaning phrase and it has some value. Yeah, you can't you, you know, you, you sure. can bring the horse to water, can't make them drink. People have to be at a right place in the recovery, but it's a double-edged sword because it can be meant in the sense of, okay, you have to get, I mean, and how many times have you been in, in, in a, you know, something, a relationship with a client where it's the, all you can really do at some point is share what the next type of things are, share some ideas to get them to think about and, and know that it's not like they're going to necessarily, you know, pick them up and implement them right there. But that at some point, because you've sown those seeds, there's this, uh, something else happens, things unfold, and those seeds are able to, you know, start to, uh, you know, take root. And they have this aha moment of, okay, you remember when you mentioned that thing to me? Oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. I get it now. When yeah. you first said it, da 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 But it's like, that that's all you can do at that point is you're, you're sowing the seeds. You're not expecting them to pick it up, but you at least know that you're laying the groundwork and, you know, while it would be wonderful and miraculous if in the next 24 hours that piece of advice or that that therapeutic tool is used, you're also knowing that all I can do is keep mentioning it on a relatively regular basis in, in again, in a way that I'm not shooting on them, but just a friendly reminder. And you know what? If they pick it up in two months, better than not at all. And that's famously... Yeah, that's that's a it's a phrase that's famously used as a cop out, at least in the mental health industry and mm. in the substance abuse in particular. They weren't ready. Yeah. Well, if you're not ready, then uh, well, I'll use that. You know, there's a shaming to when treatment yeah. doesn't work. Instead of just saying, "Isn't it sad that this isn't working?" We tend to say, "Let's blame the client or blame." Yeah. The oh, okay. They're not. They're not at this place. This is a useful tool, but we're apparently a little earlier on in the journey. Uh, you know, or maybe they're even doing something that's also healthy, but it's not what I wanted them to do yet. That's the other thing. 
speaking of hero and uh, speaking of being controlling, it's like, well, you mm-hmm. didn't go through our program in the right order of steps. Oh, okay. Well then I guess I suck. Thanks. You know? Well, and, and again, and how he would play those again in the same way that he would play the, I know Conchu it's the, I had these same things I've done with her. And I think that's the, again, especially in light, in light of what you and I do is there's places for empathy and sharing, you know, that you've got lived experience, But the idea is that everybody's journey is their own. And so if you're sharing something like that, it's more about building a bond of a relationship to say, again, I've walked a similar path. I've got a similar experience to knowing that crappy headspace. Um, And I'd like to be able to, you know, again, build a relationship and let you know that I'm on your side. But I also understand that my path and your path are not the same. And just because we pass through the same intersection we didn't pass through it in the same way at the same time with the same things under our belt. So just because I turn left down this other block doesn't mean you're not going to keep walking straight ahead or hop a fence, you know, or do whatever in another direction. So I think that was the other part was just that whole, like, Oh God, my God, like, you know, if there was ever anybody like, can't you would get upset if you didn't do what he wanted to because he's the god and he's the boss and you're supposed to be his avatar. Harrow was like that weird, like, so you kind of go, okay, again, he's the cocky a-hole god. Harrow is this guy that is like, oh, you you keep you, you think you're playing the empathy card, but you're not. <laughs> you think you're doing this thing, and it's like, yeah. I get what you think you're doing, but you're doing it really poorly and 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 and, and it's really offensive, and then you're wondering why you get pushback. You know, <laughs> or the hold on, I'm just going to go save the world because I think that's far more useful than sitting here talking to you. <laughs> Boom, I'm going to go back and, you know, and so, like I said, from a, with, what's reality, it, it, it because this is about, and I, I, again, we think about the larger thing and we're, we're in Marvel universes where, you know, gods exist and people have, you know, gamma rays do this and spiders do that and blah, blah, blah. You know, we've already got a certain level of suspension of disbelief, but what I actually love about this is you know that questioning of what is reality you know is is the real world actually the one that has the where the gods are involved um and and is the you know what we're seeing because we see two different institutions as well i don't know you um harrow refers to the putnam one and i believe i can't remember if he says it is it Chicago or Philadelphia? I can't remember what city it is, but it's an American city. And then the final scene where you see Harrow being led out in the the white limo that says Spectre in the on the license, that's the Senkois. In and and it, you see them pulling up to London. Okay. And that's that's named after Bill, so the yeah. the artist. So it, so it, it's those right. kinds of things. It's not even the it, you know is it the same place because it looked like the same place in some respects. Or again, even when right. uh, when Tara mentioned the whole oh wait a sec yeah okay yeah I guess it can be whatever you want. I've, I've I've just never done you know psychiatric institutions before. And that was the other part too in terms of what's the reality, what's the hallucination, what's the construct. Really, would a would, would that kind of a goddess really be screwing up her lines that much if that's part of her job? so again what's the reality what's the construct um you know are are they you know are they really dead dead or are they (laughs) so i love the fact that in some respects it's more of um a place to uh it's a sandbox of sorts it's like this intellectual and psychological sandbox and that i think if we try to get too much into the well which place was reality because i need to sort this out i need to know who the the prim- you know again which again you think from a very clinical perspective yes we need to figure out who the primary identity is we need to figure out what the alters are we need to figure out what the hallucinations delusions and disassociations are da, 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 da. and we need to again we need to organize it all and like you know what sometimes and i think that was where some of that pushback in the later episodes from them was coming with like wait a second what if i don't accept your reality because you've just told me that you know, a pen is either a writing utensil or it's my dog's chew toy and, and none of the, neither of which is wrong. So, <laughs> so, so what's to say that I haven't made this up in this reality to sort some other things out because I'm trying to figure out how to deal with like, you know, this really bossy, haughty God and, and, you know, my other identity who we've had a lot of back and forth push and shove, but you know what, maybe the two of us together can sort this out (laughs) and you're just standing in our way. (laughs) So, you know, not, not exactly advocating for like these sort of total client pushback, but that idea that sometimes I think, and again, the Harrow represents it. 
it's the, yeah, here's here. I've got a clinical path for you. And, and it's set out this way, as opposed to, oh, okay, you know what? I have a rough arc. Yes. I've got a plan, but I've got a plan that's got flexibility enough to address things. And I'd like to think that we can check off the certain boxes uh, along the way, but if we have to wind and do this and do that to get you there, you know what? I'm, I'm more about the big picture. And if, we have to take a slightly different path to get to, you know, points A, B, and C. Before we go, tell everybody what is uh, is, is going on with Speak Up and just other things that they can find that you're doing. I know before we've always gone down the rabbit hole of trying to remember all of my handles and whatever. So if you, the work that I do is about taking this kind of stuff, especially fandom and Marvel related stuff, and using it as a filter and a framework like we've been doing here to help people better understand mental health and neurodivergence diagnoses, lived experiences, and how we can better um, support each other, learn more, and, and, and address these things from an empowering perspective rather than these, again, negative, stereotypical things that we tend to be surrounded by. So www.speak up dot co is my website and that'll have all the social media media handles so you don't have to we don't have to go to that rabbit hole and i also work in the world of bts uh bang Pang soyodan and use their music and videos to do the same thing because of again the the positive reinforcement and the fact that they model a variety of different um therapeutic techniques and peer support and again, take a, a positive and empowering perspective on lived experience. So um, no, a lot of it's just been about updating uh, some stuff. Uh, thanks to Moon Knight, I am now going to be adding uh, disassociative identity in there because I think what, again, and we talk about in another episode of how well it reflects it, helps us understand it. And, and again, knowing folks um, with that diagnosis, how, again, it, it, it gives some, again, while cinematic, some authentic insight. So no, that's what I'm up to sort of the same old, same old doing some vast coaching for some different organizations where it's all about their employees that have, have um, come together uh, with under, again, the shared diagnosis, again, in variable forms of variable attention stimulus trait, ADHD is what most folks call it, and doing coaching for them so that they can access that superpower in the different parts of uh, your organization to their individual benefit, as well as that for um, their team. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.